So welcome everybody. Uh, today I will tell you a little bit about building a security appliance based on FreeBSD. Uh, when we will look into the market, there is no many FreeBSD based appliances. Come on, why are you doing that to me? Okay. No button and bread. Okay. So if you will look, uh, look into the um, appliance market, there is no many um, appliances based on the FreeBSD. If you will look into the um, market of the um, security appliances, there is the statistics that goes uh, even worse. So uh, my name is. My name is Mariusz Zaborski, and I'm working for Fuda Security, where we are building an appliance based on FreeBSD. Uh, in my spare time, I'm also um, a FreeBSD committer. I created also a, a, B, a Polish BSD user group, and sometimes I'm also blogging. So if you would like to read a little bit more about my work, then you can visit my, my blog as well. So today we will try to build a box similar to this one. Night black red uh, bo uh, box. We will not focus on the hardware part. We will focus only on the software part. So we will start with the data encryption because uh, we, when we are talking about the security appliance, the most important thing is the uh, data stored by the uh, by the uh, by our customers. So we will talking about data encryption, how we can protect uh, customer data. Another thing will be storage, how we configure it, which file system we are using, how does this configuration allow us to, uh, to do a secure upgrade of our product. Another part will be external storage, because it doesn't matter how many disks you will provide for your customer. If it will be 20 terabytes, 30 terabytes, there always will be customer for which this is, isn't enough space. Another thing is the remote access. So sometimes, not, not often, something goes wrong, and we need to go and check uh, what is wrong. Maybe we need to fix some data, maybe we need to uh, check some uh, database uh, tables, and so on and so on. So how our uh, support department will connect to our box. And the last, but not the least, we will be talking about the process security. So how we build an environment in which we can minimize the vector attacks in our, in our appliance. So like I mentioned, we will start with the data encryption, which is kind of one of the most important things. So we want to encrypt our data. So if somebody would take our disk from, from the appliance, he can't get to the data without the authorization. So in FreeBSD, we have uh, three different encryption methods. Mm, to be honest, we have two because native ZFS encryption is still not available. And uh, also, uh, there are some downs uh, downsides with the native ZFS encryption because not everything is encrypted with the ZFS. And data are, but some of the <coughs> metadata of the data set are not. And we uh, want to encrypt everything. We want to do full disk encryption. So we end up with GBD and the gel. Um, GBD is the oldest method uh, to encrypt the data set, uh, the data. It's with us with, uh, from FreeBSD 5.0. Uh, it supports only one uh, encryption method, it's ASCBC. Uh, it's interesting technology because for every write, there is an additional random uh, key, which, is, uh, which we also need to store. This key is used to uh, to encrypt our data. And this introduced two overheads. We need to, uh, the CPU overhead, because we need to uh, generate this key, and this display overhead, because for every write, we need to store also this uh, key for which this data was encrypted. So anybody else still using GBD? Is there anybody who use GBD? Yeah, nobody uses GBD, because it's uh, kind of uh, old technology. It's not very, um, it's not developed anymore in FreeBSD. And this is because we have gel. Gel is more standard version of encryption. It's uh, 
It allows us to encrypt data with many different uh, uh, cryptographic algorithms. Uh, the most popular is ISXTS, which you probably uh, should use as well. Uh, it doesn't introduce any uh, overheads like GPB, so it doesn't uh, do this fancy thing with um, with uh, um, with additional keys per, per write. And it also allows us to use one-time keys, which allow us to um, to encrypt our swap with key which is generated at, uh, during every boot. It also allows us to do integrity verification with HMAC. This is additional option for Gally. We don't really uh, care about that so much because finally we will uh, use ZFS and I will tell you a little bit more why, why we don't use uh, this integrity. So if we are building this appliance, so where we are keeping those, uh, those uh, secrets, the keys? So when customer will, when, uh, customer will get our appliance, the, uh, there is no encrypted data yet on the appliance itself. So during the first boot, the uh, appliance will ask the uh, customer to put two memsticks to the appliance. And during that, the encryption keys will be generated. So we, as an uh, appliance provider, don't know the secret for which the, uh, which was used to encrypt the storage. And so <coughs> after that, the uh, customer removes the pen drives, it stores in the safe or whatever, and put it only when he needs to uh, uh, reboot the machine. Some customers decide they trust their um, uh, data centers so and leave the pen drives uh, memsticks uh, in the box, but yeah, it's up to them. So with the virtual machine, there is no such thing like memstick. We would have a encrypted uh, virtual disk and uh, memstick, which is also a file, so this doesn't make sense. So with Jelly, we can just use passphrase for this or configure our appliance without any any encryption. So uh, we decided to use Jelly because this is our obvious choice for us. GDB isn't as much uh, developed as was in the past, and uh, Jelly is a new technology that we want to use. So what about the storage? Where we store our data? So in FreeBSD, we have a two major uh, file system, ZFS and UFS, and we decided to use both in a little bit different ways. So. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about the advantages of ZFS, why we decided to use it. And th those are four of them. Of course, ZFS has a lot of more advantages why, over other systems, but those are four major what we are caring uh, about the, uh, in our appliance. So checksumming. ZFS uh, allows us to use five different checksums. And what is interesting in ZFS, it's also uh, not only checks on the uh, data, but also it checks on the metadata of our uh, data set. So um, I always talk why the checksum is very important. So when I'm talking about reproducible bills or when I'm talking about ZFS, I love this example. This is a snip code from, uh, from OpenSSH. This was a bug a few years ago. And as we can see, uh, there was a bug comparison operator here. So uh, the idea is some uh, ID channel, and allocated channel is how many channels are allocated. And if this condition was, uh, was true, then we executed something as a root. And the thing is pretty much simple, because basically we changed the comparison. This was uh, uh, by one bug. So if we would look very closely to the assembly code, it would turn out that there is only one assembly code instruction which, was, which separates us from the secure and unsecure binary. If we will look uh, even closer, it would time, turns out that it's one byte, a bit, which, uh, which separates us from the secure and unsecure, uh, unsecure uh, binary. So Alan Jude has uh, his favorite um, quote, which is that these are plotting against you and you this is why you should use ZFS. And the truth is that everything is plotting against you. Your CPU is plotting against you, your microcontroller is plotting against you, your cables are plotting against you. On every disk step, 
there may be some bit flip. Of course, this is very rare situation, but it can occur. And if it occurs in such situation, then we have unsecured binary. So, uh, yeah, we want our data, uh, data uh, to be checksum. So, another interesting uh, feature of ZFS is compression. So, right now, uh, we have uh, two version of compression, GZIP L4. Uh, this standard is still on the way, uh, but uh, we decided to use LZ4 because it has a good uh, ratio between uh, um, compression and decompression data. And so uh, maybe in your scenario, GZIP will be a little bit better. So we here have an um, example from our production machine, and we get almost uh, over 16 ratio of uh, compression. So it means we store 16 more times data that really we can store. Uh, it also means that we uh, optimize the bandwidth between a storage and an application. Because if we uh, compress data before storing it, it also means that we need to send less data to disk. So it's very, very interesting. The only problem which you may occur here is that what if your customer wants to uh, send uh, data out of the appliance. We had a such situation that uh, um, our appliance said, oh, you are using only two terabytes of this. And then uh, our customer said, okay, so I will do a backup. And it, he needs uh, 20 terabytes of storage. And he was like very surprised. What, what is happening here? So yeah, but you may, may convince him also to use ZFS and problem is, is solved. Can I answer a quick question? Yeah, sure. So where is the um, encryption happening before you compress or after? So uh, before, uh, first it's compression, and there then it's encryption. Oh, encryption. Yeah, because I was going to say, if you're doing 16x on encrypted. No, no, no. So uh, I, I will show later. So 16x is before encryption. Yes, yes, yes. I, I will show a little bit later how, how these are configured. So maybe this will be a little bit more. Uh, more undisturbed. So another interesting uh, feature is snapshotting. Uh, Matt Arnes did a whole talk about the snapshot, so uh, I will only say that it's very interesting technology. Uh, we use it for uh, upgrading machine. So before every upgrade, we create a snapshot. We play with our database. We play with our file system. And if something goes wrong, we just roll back and everything is fine. Uh, you also may use snapshotting for uh, administrative purpose. So if your um, engineer go and want to do some stuff, but he isn't sure about uh, using um, some comments or playing with database, he can create a snapshot and play, uh, play without any risk of losing data. But also we are using snapshot to create a uh, cluster multi-master, which means that in our appliance you can have two nodes which are accepting data. And when during this time, we all the time create a snapshot and send them over to another appliance. So if there is any user who wants to access some data from one of the uh, nodes, he can just access from one, uh, one node. Um, it's very convenient to do, uh, thanks to, to ZFS. So this is how we, how we design a file system. So we have a local dump, which is basically uh, our dumps for, for our node, which we currently are. And we have uh, another dumps, which is basically a serial number of, of this uh, of the node. And all the time, we receiving and sending the snapshot. So here is a snapshot list. This is a snapshot we received from, from one of our nodes. And this is the situation we, where we are actually sending the uh, snapshot to the other machine. So this is the snap, we keep one snapshot only to, uh, to uh, only send the incremental snapshot from, uh, from our machine. When we add up this, uh, this uh, send, we basically remove that, uh, that snapshot. Every snapshot is basically the date of the uh, when it was created. Um, what is very interesting in ZFS is that, that it's still developing. It's not like uh, constant technology. So uh, when we are doing a uh, multi-master uh, 
cluster, we did a, a little bit overhead because ZFS, before sending the data, he needed to decompress the file system. So uh, when he was decompressing the file system, he would send the um, uncompressed data over the network. So in our case, it was like 16 times more than the actual data. So when ZFS was sending the conversion, we typed it again to LZ4. Then we manually, on the other side, decrypt the data. And then uh, ZFS again compressed the data. There wasn't any other choice. But now, after some work, uh, in new version of ZFS, we can basically send and receive data set, and uh, it will send and receive the, the encryption, uh, the uh, compressed, uh, compressed data. So, uh, what are the downsides of using ZFS? So, uh, if we are creating a snapshot, like for upgrades or, or a situation when our engineer need to do some work, uh, during this time and rollback, we, we will lose some data. So, for example, if our demos are, are storing some data in our appliance and we decided to, to roll back, we basically lose the data that those uh, demos store. And another thing is that we are using snapshots, so it cannot really roll back Z ZFS change. So, if we created a, a, a data set, or we change some compression ratio, or we upgrade whole pool, we cannot roll back that. Because snapshot is only data set property, so it doesn't care about, about any others, uh, any others uh, data sets. And uh, if there is some uh, there problem with the cluster, so for example, if, if here we couldn't send uh, the snapshot uh, from some reason, and we try and try and try, and still failing. This snapshot is kept all the time to do incremental snapshots. So our storage is, is even if we remove data, our storage doesn't free the space because it has a snapshot which basically keeps uh, keep the space. So what are the solutions for that? So uh, like I said, ZFS is still evolving. So in case of these ZFS ch uh, changes, we have now checkpoints, which are basically a checkpoint of the whole pool. So we can create a checkpoint and play with ZFS, upgrade ZFS, add additional data set, and so on. When we will revint to a previous uh, checkpoint, everything will be rolled back as well. And additionally, we have also bookmarks. So you can convert a snapshot to a bookmark, which uh, in that case, all the data will be free from the snapshot, but only the information which block was freed will be kept. So we don't need to keep the data any longer. This is good if we would decide to optimize our, our multi-master solution. So unfortunately, ZFS still have some downsides. So uh, for example, if uh, we have a situation where we have a big delete, for example, we delete some data set and a lot of space was was uh, freed and uh, our machine uh, from some reason rebooted <coughs> and we had problems that uh, there was not enough RAM to import the pool. Uh, somebody says that we should have one terabyte, uh, one gigabyte RAM for one terabyte of storage. Yes, this probably is true. So we need a lot of a lot of uh, memory to uh, for for importing uh, pools. Like I mentioned before, there is no full disk encryption in ZFS. And so, um, so maybe in your scenario, the, the ZFS encryption is good enough. In our scenario, we wanted the whole disk to be encrypted. Um, if we, something will go very, uh, very bad, and um, with ZFS, it's a quite a complex system, so it may happen. We would like to still be able to do something on our machine. And the same if we would like to decide to reset uh, our machine to factory, uh, factory settings. Because of that, we decided to use UFS. So our, uh, our, uh, our data, our customer data, is configured that uh, first we have a jelly layer, and then we have a ZFS file system on top of it. So in our case, UFS contains only read-only operating system. It contains there is no writing on, this, uh, uh, on those file systems. We only um, uh, keep the file system there. Uh, it's not encrypted. 
Uh, and if something goes wrong, we can boot, still boot from, from this partition. So if we, for example, want to only um, turn on the SSH, uh, we can. We don't need to go to, to our appliance with some additional pen drive and so on, because this is only a read-only partition, so we still can, can boot from it. There shouldn't be any harm to that. So th this is how we uh, configure our, uh, our disks. So first partition is of course boot. Then we have a free partition for systems. Every time when we, uh, when we uh, uh, upgrade our machine, a new partition is used. We have a swap zero, which is encrypted using uh, generally with uh, one-time password. And then we have a data, which is encrypted <laughs> with, uh, with jelly. And then uh, on top of the jelly, we have IZFS. So, uh, like I mentioned, we also are using uh, RAID Z2, which, uh, 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 which uh, used to this for parity, parity. So we also try to uh, reflect that in the case of UFS. So, so how we are doing it? In case of uh, system partition, it's quite simple. We basically put all the, uh, all the partition, system partition in one mirror. So if any of two disks will fail, we still can operate because this is one big mirror, so nobody cares uh, from which partition we will boot. And it's a little bit more tricky with flow uh, because if we will put it in whole a big uh, mirror, then we will lose a lot of data. So if, for example, if we have a um, four gigabytes uh, swap partition, then if we will put it in a uh, swap, then we will end up with only four gigabytes uh, swap partition. To, re to reflect right, right Z uh, promise, which we, means that we can remove two disks and we will still be able to work, we decided to group the uh, swap partition in, uh, into the three, uh, group of three. So in that scenario, we, you can remove two disks, uh, random two disks, and we still, uh, our system still would work, uh, but we also, don't, uh, we also get some more space for, for this one. So how how upgrade process is uh, is working? So we are using uh, something that uh, is called attributes in GPP uh, partition entry array. So uh, to uh, you can set some additional attributes for uh, per uh, per instance in the GPP table. So like we saw earlier, if we are booting from system zero, we are setting a boot me flag for for partition zero. When we are trying to upgrade, when we override the system one partition, and we set up two flags, boot once and boot me, which means that we will boot once from this particular partition. <coughs> we reboot our machine, and loader automatically removes boot me. So from this moment, everything, uh, if our machine would, would uh, fail, we basically would uh, go back to system zero. So let's go with this uh, with this uh, failure scenario. We create a ZFS snapshot uh, just after the, the flag was removed. The upgrade error occurred. I don't know. For example, we cannot upgrade our database or something else broken. Uh, machine is rebooted again. In this uh, in this scenario, we see that there is boot once flag. So at least once we tried from this uh, from this partition because there is no boot me flag. So we try booting from the partition uh, from the partition system system zero. Uh, we are doing a rollback at this point, and we also set a boot fail flag in the partition that we failed to boot, and that's all. We can try an uh, upgrade again. In case when we uh, succeeded, our upgrade was uh, everything was working. Uh, the boot once flag is uh, changed to boot me, and the previous boot me flag is removed. And when we are doing another upgrade, another system two is used, and the same scenario go and go. So because we have so many uh, layers, for, for example, we have a, a swap that we uh, have a mirror, we have a, a system which is mirrored, we have a jelly on top of uh, ZFS on top of jelly, we cannot use any standard method to initialize new disk. So if we want to put new disk, for example, one is broken, we cannot do that. So we need to configure DFD to do that for us. 
And unfortunately, we need to write our own script to, to do that. Uh, the ZFS daemon uh, cannot uh, create uh, a jelly encrypted data for, for us. So what about the external storage? We have a few options uh, here. Uh, first is uh, NF NFS. So uh, we are designing a, a security solution and uh, the NFS doesn't support encryption or authorization. I don't think the NFS uh, uh, version 4 uh, supports that, but I don't think there is uh, still a big usage for that. Uh, what is cool about that is that it allows you to uh, mount on multiple machines. So in case of our multi-cluster, uh, multi-master machine, it would be useful, but unfortunately we cannot use it because of those two, two reasons. So uh, our choice would be iSCSI. It's a good choice to go with. It supports encryption, it supports authorization. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, the corporation we was working with uh, didn't want iSCSI just because they uh, didn't have a controller for that. Uh, we are not uh, able to mount on multiple machines, but uh, we can live without them. So, uh, Last option is SAN over FC. Uh, there isn't uh, encryption and there isn't authentic authorization, um, but it's theoretically a separate, a separate network, right? Because it's only storage network. But we can a little bit play with that and we can also configure Jelly on top of the uh, looms that are uh, provided for us. So in case when we get the Jelly on top of those uh, on top of those uh, block device that uh, FC is providing us, we get encryption and authorization. Um, and also, all the network traffic which we send is encrypted because they're, they're basically sending the, the jelly block. So this is uh, the uh, solution that we go with. Um, we also decided to use a, uh, at least two FC cameras. We want to send, have some redundancy in our appliance. Uh, this creates a small problem as well because when we have a two uh, FC channels and we are connected to the same uh, storage machine, we see the same uh, disk, uh, but with the different uh, with the different uh, block names, I mean different devices. So we can combine them using G Multipath and solve the problem. So uh, this uh, Geom uh, Geom provider is very useful for for that. So what about the remote? Originally, we started with uh, SSH. Basically, we allow our uh, customer can uh, enable SSH in, in our appliance. Then we can uh, log into the to the machine. The problem is um, that the most secure way would be to use SSH keys because it's the hard uh, hard to hide <coughs> them. But how to manage so many uh, SSH keys? So do we have a SSH key per every client, this would create 100, 100 uh, keys for us. Uh, we can upload them somehow to machine, but still, it's 100 keys. And again, what if uh, our engineer, one of our engineers changed the job? Uh, and what then? We should uh, invalidate this key and send to the customer new keys? How often should we do that? It's also hard to force our customers to upgrade their machines, because it's basically the, our security appliance is kind of in the middle of everything. So uh, some customers are not so happy to upgrade often because they need to have some, some time to do that. Uh, so originally we have just one master key, uh, which was uh, shared by the employees and it was rotated some uh, sometimes. And so maybe we could, uh, the, the, the another problem with that is, uh, this is a SSH key. You cannot log in through uh, IPMI or WebEx if our customer needs that, right? So uh, some customers doesn't allow us to access their uh, their network, and they say, okay, you can do some uh, man payments, but only through WebEx. So how you will transfer the SSH key? Will you just give the SSH key to, to the customer? We don't want to do that. So maybe password after all. Uh, Maybe, but it's very easy to hijack everything which we type over the keyboard. We can just key log it, and then customer or anybody else can have the uh, password. And again, what if our engineer changed the job? Uh, will we rotate uh, password in all, all our customers? 
So this was uh, kind of challenging for us, but we came up with some solution. And basically we are using ASCII with some, uh, some changes uh, with, for, for us. So basically what ASCII is, is that we are taking some secret, it can be some random value number, whatever, some, some random data. Uh, but we need to store it somewhere in a secure way. Then we are using some hash function and we calculate uh, this hash function uh, as many times as we want to use this key. Uh, so for example, if we want to use uh, 50, uh, this key for uh, 50 times, we use a hash function on this, on this key 50 times. When we, uh, the result of this hash, we store on our, on our machine. So when our engineer wants to log into this machine, he needs to give n minus one password. So instead of giving, uh, and then machine is calculating this hash one more time and is comparing if the storage value is the same that uh, the calculated value. If it is, the password is correct. Then the, the password given by the user is new secret. So again, he needs to give another secret which will give the exactly the same um, hash of the storage value, and so on and so on. So we configured it like uh, 50 key, uh, keys per day. Uh, the key length is uh, 16 charts, so it's a little bit challenging to write sometimes, but it's okay. Keys rotate every day. So it also means that every day uh, we calculate uh, if, if we have a storage password in, in our, in our uh, appliance and customer will uh, enter, uh, for example, uh, we store our appliance today and we want to log in tomorrow. So tomorrow we need to give a 51 password, not the, uh, not the next password, but the 51. So we need to we rotate this password over and over. We also unify this password. This is something done by, uh, for example, Google Authenticator, so that you don't need to think if uh, L and I, this is the same uh, letter or not. So it's, it's pretty, pretty handy. And uh, this solves our problem with the, when the engineer uh, leave our job because we allow him to fetch passwords only for this week. So if he would fetch this week and he would resign next week, he doesn't know any secrets on our on our appliance. Okay. Uh, so last topic, the last topic which I would like to discuss is process security. So how we manage to keep our process secure. So we cannot build everything by uh, from scratch. So in our case, when we are using a lot of different uh, different libraries, very different protocols, we cannot build everything from scratch. We need to uh, trust somebody with that this application is this library is working good. Even if you would build everything from scratch, it doesn't mean that it's more secure than the thing that is uh, open source. We also can now audit everything. This is not our business. We want to build a security appliance. And again, even if we would audit uh, all the source code that we use, uh, all the open source co uh, code we use, this doesn't mean that uh, it's, uh, we didn't miss something. And uh, who you really trust? So do you trust your employees? Do you trust uh, the open source community? It's, it's hard to say. So. Uh, somebody from the security uh, community came up with a very uh, cool uh, quote, which I really like, which means that security stops where the trust begins. If you need to trust somebody, that means that there is no security between uh, uh, in, your, in your application. So instead of trusting, we basically can, can unprivilege this uh, source code. So what we are doing in our, in our approach is that we put all the complicated logic in an unprivileged process, and we develop a very simple privileged process that uh, that communicates with unprivileged process and gives some access to the uh, to the um, to the resources that it needs uh, through very simple IBC to reduce the trust the TCB that we need to uh, need to check and we need to maintain. So the communication between those two processes should be as simple as it can. So what can do uh, for us privileged process? 
He can have access to database, he can access storage, he can access network, uh, he can maybe authenticate uh, unprivileged crosses, depending on the, um, on the use case uh, about the application we are building. It also can extend some capabilities for unprivileged, unprivileged process. So what uh, unprivileged process can do? If privileged process give him, then he can have, for example, uh, a single file descriptor to, uh, to store some data. Maybe he needs one or two descriptors to uh, access the network, which privileged process will, will give him. Like I said, it's implementing a complicated logic which we are not able to, to allow. We can also limit, for example, RAM usage or CPU time that this process can, can, can use. So how we accomplish this, that in FreeBSD environment? So basically, we use lib and read to, uh, for our IPC, which is very simple IPC uh, library, which is in, uh, shipped with FreeBSD. And we use Capsicum for, for the unprivileged process to close it in the sample. So Capsicum is a sandbox technique which allows us to limit the access of the uh, process to global namespaces. It's very simple uh, syscall, which, uh, when you, uh, which we will, when you will call it, you don't have access to any global namespace. Also, the uh, Capsicum introduced the cap uh, capability rights, which you can uh, limit the descriptor even further. So for example, when we have our uh, storage descriptor, which stores some data on the disk, we can say, okay, you can only write to this descriptor, but you cannot seek over this descriptor. You cannot overwrite our data that we already stored. So for example, if uh, there will be some package read from the uh, network, which would exploit our application, we will hopefully store it and it cannot be overwrite by, by our the attacker. Uh, LibNV, like I said, it's very simple uh, and uh, library for IPC. It's uh, store a uh, very pre uh, very simple primitives like strings, number, bool. It can store and delete itself. But it's what is most important, which most of IPC <coughs> doesn't implement. Uh, it also can send the descriptors. So this is something that that we will uh, use often. Um, is it hard? Uh, from our experience, it's, uh, it's challenging, but it's possible. Well, our company isn't very, uh, very big, but we was able to sandbox use this technique to uh, sandbox application using OpenSSH, free RTP, um, much more, uh, much more application, which are quite big. So this approach is doable, and if you will design your uh, application from the scratch, to do this privilege separation, it's very simple to, uh, to build it. So uh, how our daemon can look like? Let's say that we are writing some proxy daemon that will accept some connection uh, from, uh, from network and will store all the data that came from, uh, from, the, from the network. So we starting with a privilege process, which is waiting for some uh, connection from the network. There is some client, it's connected to, to, our, to our process. We fork and create some privileged process. So we, basically our privileged process, only what's known is that some connection are right. He doesn't know what protocol, he doesn't know uh, what type of it, because he cannot speak in this language. Or he doesn't know uh, protocol at all. So the client is talking only with the, with the unprivileged process. After that, let's say that the client is sending uh, some credential. Let's say it's trying to authenticate. And only when the client authenticates itself, we are uh, leveraging the, the RAM and CPU limitation. Uh, the, now, the, instead of 10 megabytes, our application can, can have 100 megabytes. Uh, after that, the uh, privilege process is creating a connection to the server, is passing it to the uh, unprivileged process, and the same go for, for the storage. It's great some, uh, some uh, file, it's created a file descriptor to this file, it's sent it over the, the network and uh, over the uh, unique domain subject to the unprivileged process. All those connections can be also limited. This connection doesn't make really sense to limit because it's write and read, 
to that the server, but this connect uh, this uh, socket can be limited to be able only to uh, uh, write to this uh, to this file and not uh, overwrite some some data. So besides um, besides uh, Capsicum, we also have a Gems um, and Cloud API, which also can uh, be used to separate some programs. If our application for some reason cannot be uh, Capsicumized, maybe you can close it in the jail and also create some IPC to communicate with that. Or we can use Cloud API, which uh, needs some more development than than uh, Capsicum, but it's also possible to, to do it. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and maybe there are some questions about the presentation. Okay, so if you want to talk about uh, the topic or uh, about something else related to, to the uh, FreeBSD, I will be able to talk with you after the, uh, the talk and somewhere on the uh, conference. So thank you very much. There is actually a question. So I'm a bit confused about exactly why you didn't want to use that best so from our experience uh, ZFS is kind of big uh, big component of uh, operating system if some people crash ZFS, ZFS itself we wouldn't be able to uh, uh, to um, Fix that with, uh, with using ZFS itself, right? Because uh, if we need ZFS to boot ourselves, and something is wrong with our ZFS, then we are not able to to, to boot anymore, right? Okay, so it's mainly fear of what is not. Yeah. So our appliance was uh, designed in the times where ZFS wasn't as stable as it's now. So yeah, mainly mainly from from this. And you know we don't need any additions from uh, ZFS, which goes uh, for for those system partitions, because uh, of course we could consider now using boot environments and so on. But our main reason is that what if our ZFS will not uh, not uh, will not work anymore. So if you were going to build it now, is that still a concern? So ZFS now is much more stable. Uh, that said, we still uh, had some issue, for example, that uh, we wasn't able to import the pool when it crashes some random uh, in some random moment. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that this approach is uh, is the way to go, especially if you are using ZFS in in uh, in other, uh, uh, yeah, if you are uh, overusing ZFS. I understood the 50 times hashing. Can you put that slide again? Yeah, sure. So, uh, basically, you, you are uh, generating some secret. It can be whatever you want, right? And then you hash it 50 times. And this is the secret you are, you are storing uh, on your appliance, right? When this is the secret you want to, uh, which you are storing, and this is the this is the same secret. So to authenticate, you know you the, the appliance know this this secret, right? So to authenticate, you give the previous secret, the, the previous hash from from this secret, right? Because it's hard to calculate from this the previous one. So which appliance need to do? It's only need to hash once. And decide. Oh, is this hash uh, the same that I know? That uh, this hash which I know. If it is, then you are authenticated, and the new secret is the hash which you provide. And to authenticate again, you, the secret is the hash you provide. So you need to know the secret that was calculated from this hash, right? And it's go over and over and over. So with the 50 hashes, is that. We set up our daily limit for 50 hashes. So if, uh, so let's say you want to have hashes for uh, for uh, for two days. So you're calculating the 
uh, hundreds times, right? So the hash you are storing is this one, but uh, you are you are storing it today as you uh, you will uh, log in tomorrow. So instead of giving the next hash, which is uh, which is uh, meant to be for today uh, for tomorrow, you will give a fifteen hash, which is for today. Okay, and if we have more hashes, then fifty next hash will be uh, the next day, and so on and so on and so on. Thanks to that, uh, you are uh, protecting yourself from brute, for brute forcing, and that somebody will get uh, hashes. Let's say for uh, you, some of your, some of your employee will get like twenty hashes and will not use any of them. And after uh, when he will be fired or change the job, he will start using it in the uh, customer environment. Okay? So because we are skipping some of these hashes, we are protecting against that. Yeah? So just to follow up to that, when we're talking about SSA key for an issue, yeah. the key management, did yeah. you look at the authorized principles feature, which uses like the KI, so that you would avoid a lot of the seamless overthought? Yeah, but you still would... Uh, you would need to rotate it when, uh, for example, because uh, with, uh, we would store a, uh, how we would revoke the key, basically. This is the question. Because if you would revoke the key, we somehow need to inform all our clients, which often don't have access to the internet, that this key is revoked, right? <coughs> so I'm just wondering if issuing, uh, and I haven't looked at the details, but just issuing keys that don't matter. Kind of the same ideas. Uh, yeah, but this would be very problematic when you know uh, when there is a problem in the client and one of our engineers doesn't have a valid valid certificate, and then the security officer would, would, should need uh, should uh, validate this, uh, create a new certificate from him. It would be a little bit uh, more tricky. With this, uh, we also because. Uh, not only our engineers can now log into the machine, we can also provide, for example, such key for uh, the uh, for our partners. And uh, another problem with the key is that you cannot pass it through WebEx or uh, IPMS, so this also will not work. In this approach, you basically pass the password. So IPMI, WebEx, whatever works, even if you, uh, the, the password will be hijacked, no matters, nobody knows the next password. Okay, so thank you very much.